Hey everyone, hope you're doing alright. Was working on a more depressing topic, then out of nowhere felt like diving into some happier chapters about a peaceful time in this fake world. The era that followed the Mad King's erratic hold over the Seven Kingdoms, that I'll be calling Robert's Peace. But first, look down and check if you're subscribed. Uh, thank you, thank you. As for Robert's Peace, that's what I'm calling the 15 years that preceded the start of the story. Things had to be running smoothly if a king and his whole party can travel for a month from King's Landing to Winterfell, just to ask Ned to come back with them. After settling his ass on the Iron Throne, things were instantly better for the realm. No more decisions made based off paranoia. Only one kingdom truly worried Robert Baratheon during his reign, and that was Dorne. A fearless, passionate people that's had their problems with every ruling family so far. Because of their mistreatment towards the Dornish, whether it be the first Targaryens, Robert, and other Lannisters. Big L for Robert would never set foot in Dorne, not because he was scared, but he craved the people's love. There must have been guilt for what was done to Rhaegar's children at the last moments of the rebellion. However, I think being in a kind of foreign land where everyone hates you would be too much for Robert's ego. Robert made friends easily though. A lot of his own bannermen decided to not take up his cause in the early moments of the rebellion. Battles were fought in his own homeland, where he had to crush the same people that swore fealty to House Baratheon. But like nothing happened, soon they would be his loyal supporters and friends. Everything was cool after the battles. The continent had some of the same old issues during Robert's peace, like wildlings, mountain clan raids, and kidnappings. But it did seem like the kingdoms were all united and happy with Robert's coronation. Many of the kingdoms came together to take out this dangerous, unstable threat. It wasn't that long ago that the thought of removing Targaryens from power seemed impossible. Yes, there was some plotting going on in the Iron Islands during Robert's peace that had come to the forefront six years into his reign, but nothing to bring fear into the commoners' homes and the nobles' castles. Robert's peace had almost nothing to do with him after looking closely at this time period. It really came down to two things. His foster father, John Arryn, who was asked to take on the role of Hand of the King and the coincidental timing of the Great Summer, the longest summer ever recorded in the story, it took up 10 of Robert's 15 years in power. No harsh winters mean no starving small folk. More harvests means less chaos. And there wasn't even any widespread contagious diseases that have inflected some other eras. Thanks to John Aaron, the situation with Dorne was dialed down from potential war to a cordial atmosphere. The Westerlands completely stayed out of the rebellion, even after the Mad King's orders for Tywin's support. Tywin wanted nothing more than to see the Mad King dead after what he put him through during his time as his old best friend and Hand of the King but he would do whatever was best for his family and legacy. Jumping over to Robert's cause right away would be risky. Plus, he had his son Jamie to think about, who was at the Mad King's side at all times as his Kingsguard. Tywin had the power to save the Targaryen's dynasty, but he only made a move after Robert killed Rhaegar in single combat. After sacking King's Landing, Tywin ordered the deaths of Rhaegar's two very young children he had with the princess, Elia Martell. They were brutally murdered, and then the mountain proceeded to assault Elia with her son's blood still on him, before finally killing her too. The Dornish, especially the Martells, wouldn't forget this. Orban wanted a straight up war with the newly appointed Baratheon Targaryen alliance. Jairon personally went to the Martells' home, carrying their uncle's remains, in hopes to broker peace. This was the first real task as Hand of the King. Couldn't ask for a more challenging one with how unpredictable Oberyn was. He was already rallying support for the young Viserys Targaryen who was in exile in the continent over. But Jon Arryn seemingly succeeded in talking things down with the Prince Duran Martell. Robert's peace was very fragile though. Duran Martell just operated differently than his younger brother Oberyn. His revenge would come in time, when the perfect opportunity came. While the realm was celebrating a successful mission, Oberyn was on his way to meet with the man protecting the last known Targaryens. Sir Willem Dory was the man who was able to smuggle or safely transport the kids to Bravos for safekeeping away from Robert. Willem and Oberyn signed a pact that when they were of age, Viserys would marry Prince Duran's daughter and together overthrow the Baratheons. Things obviously didn't go as planned, but for as long as Robert sat on the Iron Throne, the Martells and Dornish played nice. There were more cracks in Robert's peace forming. Disastrous seeds were being planted, and other women and in Cersei. Robert would always remain in love with the idea of Lyanna Stark, without ever truly knowing her. Their wedding betrothal never panned out, thanks to Rhaegar. Robert didn't even want to marry after her death, but Jon Arryn talked him into marrying Cersei in 284 AC, a year after the rebellion concluded. Marriages tied the Arryns, Tullys, and Starks onto the Baratheons, 
but Robert's hold on power was still new and fragile. A marriage alliance with the Lannisters would cement things. Cersei is the same girl that was denied a betrothal with the Prince Rhaegar, and the royal status. So she was excited to finally have her dreams of being queen come true. It was a completely loveless marriage. Robert didn't care for her, and Cersei would quickly develop a deep hate for him. At one point, she even had Jaime help aboard what would be Robert's only true-born heir with Cersei. Robert already had a bastard daughter from his time in the Vale, and more rumored. His sleeping around didn't stop after married life either. But Cersei's infidelity was a nasty low. She slept with her twin brother Jaime the day of their wedding, and would continue to do so. But Robert made more bastards with different women. Cersei was extremely reckless when she chose to sleep with Jaime. Robert being in the same castle didn't bother her. If Robert ever found out, Joffrey, Marcella, and Tommen wouldn't even be safe from his wrath. None of them belonged to him. All Jaime's. Robert didn't care for his quote-unquote kids. Joffrey actually disgusted him. He feared seeing the little psychopath on the Iron Throne one day, with Cersei standing behind him. Robert particularly hated that Joffrey would cry when he picked him up. While the realm was at peace, Robert's home life was a disaster. He even disliked his younger brothers, preferring the company of foster bro Ned Stark. After plotting and watching Robert sit on the Iron Throne for six years, Lord Balon Greyjoy declared himself King of the Iron Islands. To kick off his rebellion, the Lannister fleet was burned to gain an advantage. Balon saw Robert's reign as weak and thought he didn't really have the other nobles' support, but Balon's a dumb character. The prospect of a new war only brought back the fire within Robert. He wanted nothing more than something to smash with his hammer, because killing Rhaegar only once wasn't enough for him. Alcohol, hunting, and whoring was only a temporary fix for him. Fighting was the only thing he knew how to do. He was good at it and it actually made him happy. He knew he wasn't meant to rule and had no interest in it. Didn't have the same sense of duty as the people surrounding him his whole life. So he made them do all the real work, while well, he just made things more difficult. All he dreamed of was one day riding off to Essos, leaving his family and responsibilities behind to become a sellsword, fighting for hire. Robert, with the help of the North and Westerlands, easily crushed the Greyjoy Rebellion. It was so insignificant that this era is still considered peaceful. Finding no one else to smash, he went back to doing the only thing he knew how to do. Robert would purposely miss every one of Cersei's labors to go out and kill some animals. Even in their strained relationship, Cersei somehow did have the ability to sway Robert on certain decisions, like who to appoint on the King's Guard and who would squire for him. All very dangerous things to leave up to Cersei. At one point, Robert plans on bringing his first bastard child to court, the one he had in the Vale a while back. Then Cersei said, The city is not a healthy place for a growing girl, an indirect threat on her life, since she may have come in the way of Joffrey's succession. Robert hits Cersei after she threatened the only child he spent real quality time with before abandoning her too. But Cersei's words worked, so back he went to drinking. Jon Arryn had his own wife poisoning his ears to sway his decision making. Lysa Tully suggested bringing Peter Baelish to court and serve as master of coin for how efficient he was working the ports and dealing with taxes and tariffs. Robert and Littlefinger were a dangerous team in King's Landing. One could spend every piece of gold in the world on ridiculous things, and the other would find more regardless of the consequences. Littlefinger clearly wanted to bankrupt the realm to help bring in more chaos. Extravagant tourneys and festivals made Robert happy and helped pass the time. John Aaron ruled well, but horrible at seeing through a person's true colors. He's the sole reason Littlefinger rose so high in status, and he made the Lannisters so powerful. The Mad King, as horrible and cruel as he was, left the treasury overflowing with gold. But at the start of the story, the crown is 6 million gold dragons in debt. It's the Iron Bank and Lannisters. Gold dragons are just the name of the currency in the Seven Kingdoms. Littlefinger and the Lannisters were pulling the strings and playing the long con. Robert's peace was at the verge of crumbling, but all the other kingdoms, whether it be small folk or nobles, wouldn't notice. The Iron Islands went from being a nuisance to a huge embarrassment. They lost so much during the failed rebellion that they had to keep to themselves sulking for a while. This meant peace for their neighbors who they usually raided. The Vale had their lord all the way in King's Landing, so had to have a steward take care of everyday matters in his absence. That went to Lord Nestor Royce, who worked thanklessly for 14 years. Ned was never expected or prepared to rule, but with his older brother Brandon sentenced to death by the Mad King, along with their father, Lord Rickard Stark, Ned was forced to quickly grow up. Wildlings would always be a threat for the north, but with the long summer, this kingdom had it better than ever. Westerlands stayed neutral during the rebellion, so lost a few men and resources, but the Ironborn really screwed them over by burning the Lannisters' entire fleet. Still, 
Things were good, with how much the crown owed to House Lannister, thanks to all the gold mines. The Riverlands always have the worst during times of war, because their unfortunate location on the map, bordering so many other kingdoms with no natural defenses, means a lot of invasion. But no invasions during Robert's Peace. While der Frey became the lord who arrived late, for staying out of all the battles and showing up when it was already over, so the Tullys and all the other lords in the Riverlands had a good time poking fun at this shitty character. Renly Baratheon, only a child after the rebellion, was given the family's castle and seat of Storm's End when Robert moved into the Red Keep in the Crownlands. Things were awkward with the Reach for how loyal they were to the Targaryens during Robert's rebellion. They have the highest population and vital harvests, so it was time to patch things up. Stannis directly had to deal with the siege with Lord Mace Tyrell, so asking him to marry a Tyrell wouldn't be realistic. But Stannis did marry a lady from a prominent house in the Reach, House Florent. Renly would have Loras Tyrell squire for him later in life, and things cooled off, and all was good in the world, unless you were in the path of Khal Drogo's Kylostar over in the east. News of an undefeated Khal was spreading, and his army was growing very large. But with their culture avoiding the sea because their horses don't drink salt water, no one in Westeros had to worry about the Dothraki, well, yet. Robert kept some of the Mad King's old crew around, like Jaime and Barristan, part of his Kingsguard and Varys as the Master of Whispers, aka a spy master. What almost no one knew was what Varys was hiding all these years. A child he claims to be Rhaegar's trueborn son. The baby the mountain killed was just an imposter that Varys found in the city. Viserys and Danny troubled Robert enough, but a bigger threat in Aegon VI, a true heir, would immediately set him off. Ned Stark or Jon Arryn wouldn't be able to talk him out of killing what he referred to as Dragon Spawn. Littlefinger, the Lannister, Varys, Robert's own self-sabotage, all taking time bombs to end peace and kick off the Game of Thrones. But for 15 years, as fragile and unenjoyable as it was for Robert, his peace, that had little to actually do with him, did good for this world, until it was finally shattered with the assassination of Jon Arryn.